Hello once again. And good morning. Please, we would like to begin. Um, there's a webinar on IT governance, building resilience, governance structures in digitalized ecosystem, uh, ecosystem and COVID-19 uh, for the health of Okay, so now I'd like to begin with the opening statement from Mr. Musa from National IT Agency. Please, Mr. Musa, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. I bring you greetings from the Minister of Communications and Digitalization, Honorable Esla Usu Ekufu, and the Director General of NITA, Mr. Ochirifu, the Richard Ochirifosu. It is a pleasure to participate with you to learn and share experiences on what it takes to manage and implement successfully any IT initiative within our institutions. The National IT Agency is the regulator of the digital workspace in Ghana and is backed by Act of Parliament, Act 771 and 772 of 2008, with specific objectives to regulate the provisions of ICT and ensure the provision of quality ICT, promote standard of efficiency, ensure quality of service. It is also to implement and enforce the provision of the Electronic Transaction Act and regulations made under the Act, among others. NITA's objective is to ensure delivery of better digital services in the public sector through interoperable ICT systems that work seamlessly and coherently across the public sector. The provision of reliable and quality digital service are critical in the ongoing digitalization in the country. As different ministries, departments, and 
agencies, MDAs, and MMDAs develop IT systems supporting their businesses. A defined set of shared IT, uh, shared standards and policies to guide selection of technology channels and so on, i.e. the interoperability framework and enterprise architecture are critical success factors. Transforming government operations and service delivery requires investing heavily in data center infrastructure, IT related skills and competencies, IT systems and network cap networking capabilities to create an enabled environment for ICT based business transformation. Technology offers enormous opportunity in the digitalization of business operations. However, to be successful, the digital transformation process must be underpinned by the adoption of international best practices, standard framework, and organizational structure and practices. Human resource capacity with various skill set must be planned and executed at each MDA, MMDA. IT government can, gov, governance can be referred to as the foundation or bedrock of digitalization. The success of the ongoing digitalization of the health sector and then government as a whole will be heavily dependent on the depth and the extent to which managers and IT professionals recognize and respect IT government governance attributes. NITA, as a regulator, recognizes the critical role of IT governance in the ongoing digitalization of the public sector businesses. It, is, it also lays a strong emphasis on the need to address the people, processes, and technology factors. The importance of IT governance in government digitalization efforts led NITA to develop IT governance standards, among others. I will encourage you to be familiar with it to support the digitalization program. In carrying out our mandate, NITA will ensure compliance of all IT laws, rules, policy, standards, guidelines all aim at effective ICT use and implementation in government. The implication of not adherence, non-adherence to best practices and non-compliance of the standards and laws will result in criminal negligence as in section 117 section 118 and section 119 and so on of the electronic transaction at seven at seven seven two of 2008. nita is happy to be part of this series of health it webinars we underwrite the competencies of the speakers mr ck bruce has over 20 years of enormous and rich experience in the IT governance. And he has been a mentor to some of us. Please pay attention, listen carefully, take notes, and endeavor to implement their suggestions when the need arises. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Musa. That was very much appreciated. Now, moving on, we'd like to give way to our very own Mr. Sam Kwashi, Head of IT, Ghana Health Service. Yeah, good, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the ICT, IT governance webinar 
my name is Sam Kwashi and I'm the head IT for the Ghana Health Service. So uh, I think we're going to have a great time. Um, I'm going to walk you through the evolution of digital health systems in the healthcare ecosystem as it is, as well as the IT governance practices. Um, it's going to be a jolly good ride. There could be a few bumps along this way, and I'll encourage you to fasten your seatbelt. Okay, so my presentation is going to follow this outline. I'm going to present an overview of digitalization and the highlights of the ICT 4A day, which is a blueprint on the use of technology in the country. Uh, I'll provide fine details of the digital health ecosystem, as well as the IT governance strategic um, activities that needs to take place. What will happen to you if you have poor IT governance uh, systems implemented and some common mistakes that needs to be avoided. Okay, so now in the healthcare industry, what we've tried to do is to adapt technology in the provision of care. Traditionally, we've been using paper. As you see on the screen, we have paper prescription form, laboratory form, all these gets into uh, another paper patient folder, which is packed into a storeroom in a not tidy manner, which makes retrieval difficult, as well as also impacting on clinical uh, decision making. So we started talking about digitalization. So what is digitalization? Um, is the use of technology to help uh, clinical decision making, improving quality of care, increasing access, uh, make sure we have uh, safe uh, computing environment, uh, healthcare is affordable, and also data is shared in a responsive and, and responsible manner. And uh, to speak about digitalization, you need to understand three broad concepts. The first concept is a digitization process. Digitization is where you convert your manual documents into a digital format which can be read by a computer. And then if you now look at the digitized, digitized uh, information and process into a format that supports clinical or any decision making process, then we are talking about digitalization. So if I scan all the patient's paper folders into a digitalized format, which allows me now to search using the computer, laptop, whatever software application for records of patients, get details on their medical history, I'm involved in the digitalization process. Now to embark on any digitalization agenda, you need to have a digital transformation uh, strategy. You cannot just buy software and laptop and you know internet and think that that's it. No, you need to understand the processes and steps you, you have to uh, uh, comply with before you reap the gains that you gain from leveraging technology in your business processes. Even though technology has enormous potential, it can also uh, create problems for you. I mean, they are um, you can get attacked by hackers, you can get malware attack, like ransomware, and you can lose all your data. So to embark on a digitalization in the, among the MDA, the government of Ghana developed um, this blueprint called the ICT 4AD. As I mentioned, you know, you don't just buy computers and laptops and software and think that, you know, you need to have a strategy. So the blueprint on Digital transformation of Ghana is called the ICT for AD, and this is the document. In this document, there's a component on healthcare, and that spells out what the healthcare is supposed to do in terms of leveraging uh, technology in this digital and clinical transformation processes. Okay, now to realize the dreams and objectives of the vision of the ICT, the government of Ghana set up the National IT Agency, um, which serves as the implementation arm or the regulatory body for the, it's like, I like to call them as the IT manager of the government. So they are in charge of the IT of the country and they kind of call the shots with regards to legal and regulatory framework and support monitoring and evaluation and coming up with standards and processes and guidelines on what you need to do. So NITA is a key player in the whole digitalization agenda in the country. Now, 
So to embark on digitalization in the health sector, or I'm going to walk you through what we have done in the health sector by identifying what components exist in the ecosystem. The first thing we did in the health sector is to buy computers. Okay, so um, in the health sector, you find out in the delivery of care, we have servers, we have laptops, we have desktops, we have tablets, and we have smartphones in the ecosystem. So if you are IT in charge of an IT infrastructure, you have this uh, I call them suite of computing equipment that you must manage. In addition to that, we work with various um, kinds of operating systems. So based on where you are, which health institution you belong to, or what services you, you provide, you realize that you, you'll be running either Windows OS server with various versions, either 2008 or 12 or 16 or 19. You'll be running the Windows server software category which is essential standard data center. If you are running a Mac operating system, these are the various versions, the Moja, Catalina, Monterey, and then Windows OS. There's also the Microsoft Office for both Mac and Windows. There's the Linux, and also for mobile phones and smartphones. In addition to that, there are also several software applications. I think the last time I checked, we have over 50 software uh, applications across board, and they cover electronic health records, that is the hospital information management systems. We have the LMIS, which is the logistics and supply chain management system. We have HR management information systems. We have the Sage Act Park accounting software, as well as the government of Ghana's GIFMIC uh, financial management platform. We have transport management information system. We have several software applications. And these software applications all come in different programming uh, languages. They range from simple or modular applications to integrated, uh, connected software application to meet the enterprise needs of healthcare providers. The challenge is that the ownership of most of the software are not defined. So once you buy a software, it's not too clearly defined who it belongs to, and 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 it becomes a source of contention when uh, some issues come up when the projects come to an end. Okay, so now we also have the intelligent burden uh, management system. Most of the hospitals that are coming up now are smart hospitals. The infrastructure is driven by high tech, so. We have the lighting system, the access control system, the AC, the air conditioners, they run voice over IP and security all integrated to the network infrastructure. So we no longer have a standalone um, solution where you turn on and off the switch in a healthcare facility. They are integrated and, and we these are, these are technologies that are, have been implemented to help in terms of managing post and also some eco-friendly um, uh, system. So this also has to be managed. Then also we have the sub data systems. So once you buy a computer, you have an operating system, you have a software that is being used. The next thing is that the data must be stored in storages. So we have external storages, which I believe you are familiar with. We have the solid state drive, uh, which is reliable and fast. We have the network asset storage, uh, then we have the normal flash drive that we use, the UAB flash drive, and also now we have the cloud uh, storages. Now, the data that is collected from the ecosystem uh, encompasses patient data, financial data, HR data, uh, logistics management information systems, images, audio files, video files, uh, computer and event data, IT security, incidents uh, from firewalls, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems. There is also the network infrastructure data packages, and then also identity and access management log files. So if you are a data protection supervisor, uh, these are like a few of the category of data you should keep your eyes on when you are carrying out your activities. Now, the data that is collected also needs to be protected. So there are data security issues. There is what we refer to as data in use, which is data that is being used uh, real time. So for instance, my presentation that I'm doing now, um, I'm managing data in use. My presentation, my PowerPoint is 
being carried out on data in news, the data at rest, which is data being stored on your hard disk, and there's a data in transmission. Data in transmission basically refers to a scenario where you are using like a telemedicine uh, system where you have two people, you have two systems, and there's data interchange between a remote location, like in the urban areas, and then a, uh, and then a, uh, yes, a remote location in the, at the community level and, uh, and, and the urban area where a specialist is providing care. So there is data moving back and forth, and all these three categories of data needs to be secured, and you must be clear in your mind how to secure uh, the data. In addition to that, we have very complicated network infrastructure. So we have various types of cables. I mean, we have the CAT5, CAT6, CAT7 uh, cable you being used at most of our healthcare institutions. We have a local area network and wireless area network. We have a smart network infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier, mostly used by smart hospitals. We have software defined network infrastructure. We have voice over IP. We have several routers and switches belonging to or uh, emanating from various vendors. Uh, we have a storage area network. We have the integrated building management system. And a new functionality now is integrating uh, medical diagnostic equipment into the CT scans. Uh, over the years, we've been buying digital um, CT scans, um, digital MRI, MRIs, uh, digital lab analyzers, and all these have motherboards and software application that permits you to integrate or interface them into the network uh, infrastructure and the data that is generated by these medical diagnostic equipment are stored in what we call the picture archiving and communication uh, system various forms of internet connectivity are also available um, there's the fiber uh, network um, connectivities that run uh, internet then also we have the normal ADSL, which is provided by the ISP. So if you have a phone line, they bring you a little, um, uh, like a box, and you can connect your cable to it and you get internet via ADSL. And then we have what is also uh, so much in vogue, the modems and MIFIs, uh, which also runs internet of things um, and global SIM cards. The applications or system that we run um, are also hosted in the cloud. So we have embraced an adapted cloud computing uh, solution. So we have the infrastructure as a service, uh, we have the software as a service, and then we also have the platform as a service. The digital electronic records also needs to be classified. So the digital access needs to be classified. It must be clear in your mind how those digital access uh, will be distributed, how they will be stored, how do we be archived? What system are in play for retrieving those digital assets? And when you do not want them anymore, what do you do to make sure they are properly uh, destroyed? Then we also have uh, the medical diagnostic devices and wearable. The COVID-19 pandemic um, exposed us to various forms of uh, emerging handheld devices. I mean, I. For the first time, I saw uh, an infrared, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, thermometer, and there are also those infrared thermometers that do not only take your temperature, but they also uh, take a shot of you. Your, they have your images, which is embedded, and it's sent by over the network to some uh, storage devices. So all these devices don't just operate on its own. They are configured uh, on the network. Uh, they have to be calibrated rightly. They run software that needs to be updated and fixed. And they will be integrated into a local area network. And finally, uh, the data generated that are stored in uh, the parks, picture archiving, and communication system also are sometimes accessed by third parties for the purposes of generating analytics and also providing um, support. We have teleradiology systems that um, uh, run by implementing um, medical digital x-ray equipment in remote locations. They collect images from patients and where we don't have a lot of radiographers. These images are transmitted over the network onto a command and control center where you have a team of professional radiographers who read the x-rays, interpret it, and send them to the remote locations for help to help the physicians in their clinical decision making. 
In addition to that, we also have a teleradiology laboratory system, which works with lab digital lab analyzers with an integrated wireless uh, facility. Um, this runs an artificial intelligence software. Um, it also has a big data analytics tools, as well as a mobile device management system that enables uh, us to track where the devices are and what condition they are in to make sure that um, they are not uh, accessed uh, by any unauthorized people. And then it also comes embedded with integrated messaging platform. So if you visit or your test is, um, you visit any of these centers with these equipment, you get feedback on the care that is delivered via SMS. And that is part of the integrated uh, solution. Then also we rolled out um, or adapted a digital payment platform. So some of the hospitals have mobile money accounts, they accept Visa, and MasterCards. Um, they also use the NETA payment gateway, that is the .gov.gh. And um, they have also institutionalized cash and bank uh, collection, whereby healthcare institutions, mostly hospitals, when they collect their fees for the day, do, are not saddled with moving the cash from one end to another end. Uh, but then the banks come and count the cash, collect it, and send them to their bank accounts or credit account real time. And it's an excellent way of making sure that uh, the leakages in data and revenue and also uh, data that is must be available, available real time are uh, addressed. There is also the bank transfer uh, system. Now I am walking you through this ecosystem because I want you to understand the complexities involved in embarking on a digitalization process and how it's, it, it must be driven by a rock solid and resilient IT uh, governance. Then there is also social media. Um, uh, social media is one or excellent uh, encouraging or laudable uh, patient experience. So most healthcare institutions now use social media uh, as a tool for promoting uh, healthy lifestyles and also collecting feedback on how care is delivered and what they think uh, healthcare institutions must do uh, to improve on the customer service or patient engagement systems they have in, in place. Then we have a logistic information management system. Um, you know, if you recall, central medical stores, when it got bent, we lost everything. So we had to uh, implement a solution that uh, would meet our needs. We thought that one way of addressing the issues that uh, had bedeviled the central medical stores was to adapt the logistic information management system a web-based platform, cloud-based, that will provide real-time information as well as point on sales platform um, to institutions that require them. After all the data is collected, you need to protect the patient data. The healthcare industry is an information-rich uh, industry. Uh, uh, it involves several stakeholders and several uh, data is collected on patient and this data is also accessed by several key stakeholders. So uh, the need to ensure the privacy, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of patient data is paramount. And that patient data must also be constructed in a way that does not harm the patient. So if you implement a uh, biomedical digital device, you must be mindful of the need to address patient safety. You want to make sure that lab results are accurate, uh, they are reliable, they are timely. You want to make sure images are of the quality that you require. If it's a 3D or 2D, you want to make sure the standard is confirmed. And you want to make sure that if you are transforming or transferring any uh, 3D images of any patient, there is no loss of quality. You need to figure out what to do when there is data loss as well as a systems uh, a failure. So patient safety and data protection is key in the digitalization uh, undertakings. In addition to that, you need to make sure that um, the IT security issues are addressed. Uh, network infrastructure must be robust and resilient. There should be firewalls, 
as well as intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems. When CCTVs are implemented, you have to make sure that they follow best practices and, and protocols and do not infringe on individuals' privacy. Business continuity and disaster recovery plans must also be uh, in place to prevent any chaos or uh, patient uh, loss that could arrive from inability or infunctionality of your IT infrastructure. There is also currently an, an increasing adoption of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, systems. The telemedicine, uh, the teleradiology and telelaboratory uh, initiative I mentioned earlier on are all driven by uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, applications. The under the tele radiology systems, when your image is taken and undertaken, we have a computer assisted uh, artificial intelligence system for TB. So the system application is intelligent and it can tell from the X ray images whether you have a broken rib or you have a, a TB infected, you are infected by TB. And it's, and it's, it's, it's a great way of improving or supporting the clinical decision making. There's currently also robotic surgery where uh, a lot of the uh, equipment in the theaters are driven by artificial intelligence and they have some robotic inclinations. There is also the healthcare assistance where um, you, you get feedback, routine feedback from automated systems on care that is believe, uh, delivered. Um, also, I believe we are all exposed to messaging and collaborative tools during the COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, messaging platforms like the Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, Pronto Mail, and uh, corporate emails were in uh, massive use across the world. Uh, telecom community tools such as Zoom, WebEx, um, the Microsoft Teams, uh, GoToMeeting, and other corporate uh, e-applications were also used. I am currently using the Microsoft Teams for this uh, webinar presentation, and it's one of the, uh, if I can mention, the best things that happened to uh, me during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, where we were locked down and we needed to communicate and collaborate, and you couldn't do that in person. So you had to find out some innovative and creative ways of doing it. Okay, so now you also need to provide IT support. So if you work in an institution like mine, where you have healthcare institution dotted all over the country, at the regional level, at the district level, at the communities, um, at the urban centers, you might be mindful of how to support applications, what kind of logistics and competencies are required. And in terms of logistics, you have to make sure your IT team have uh, proper toolkit and network toolkit, so you don't use kitchen knives as a screwdriver to open uh, laptops and deal with other hardware. You must also understand the skill sets uh, required. Uh, you need A plus hardware. You need to understand that you, to be able to provide uh, IT support and do it well, it's a skill. You need to have training in IT uh, version three or version four. You need to define the levels of support, uh, level one, level two, level three, who is going to be in charge of level one, level two, level three support, uh, what are the contracts say if you have signed a contract with a software vendor in terms of so providing support and what help desk applications are you going to use in ensuring that your IT infrastructure is functioning the way it's supposed to be. Then also the use of technology, as I mentioned, does not only come with only great and wonderful things. There could be times where you also breach uh, some legal and regulatory frameworks or the patient who sue. So medical legal issues need to be addressed. How do you manage your intellectual property and copyright issues? Um, how do you deal with regulatory compliance and breaches? For instance, how do you comply with um, the directive from the national people like the National IT Agency or the Data Protection Act, the National Cyber Security Authority? Who is in charge of managing legal issues should they arise? Who is in charge of reviewing contracts and memorandums of understanding, service level agreement, data sharing agreement with dead, third parties um, to support your, your IT infrastructure. So digitalization comes with all these 
um, activity that you need to be mindful of and you need to have some structure or system in place to address. Then in addition to that, you have to think about how are you going to finance your entire digitalization process? Do you know your IT project portfolio? Do you, do you have a fair idea back to back of, of the details of your IT uh, infrastructure or digital health ecosystem? Have you profiled your IT assets? Do you know which of them is critical? And what, what we refer to as, uh, what do you call it? Uh, mission critical system said that when they go offline, you are in deep, deep, deep trouble. What kind of funding mix strategies do you have? Do you have a strategy that matches your, your financing and IT portfolio management process? Do you have a, a model that says that, listen, you are going to segment your, your IT assets into some segments and make sure you have a phased approach in the funding when it comes to it because definitely you would have to be making continuous investment into IT infrastructure. So there will be one off investment, there will be recurring investment in the area of capacity building, licensing, uh, renewal, and also refresh. What are the time horizons are you looking at? In the, in the short term, what are you looking at? In the middle term, what are you looking at? In the long term, what are you looking at? How are you going to manage the funding requirement of those three phases, your short term, your middle uh, term, and the long term? One emerging issue that is coming up now is the cyber security following the promulgation of the Cyber Security Act. Uh, healthcare institutions have been identified or designated as a critical information infrastructure. Have you thought about it? Do you have any funding arrangement to make sure your institution is positioned to meet the requirements of the Cyber Security Authority? So financing is key. It's a key component of the entire digitalization uh, process. OK, so how do you ensure that there is strategic alignment uh, after what I have just walked you through. OK, so you need to understand that there are regulators in the ecosystem, digital ecosystem. You cannot just do what you want. You must know that there is NETA. You must know who the cybersecurity authorities is. You must also know the role data protection uh, commission plays in the ecosystem, as well as the fact that sooner or later you'll be visited by the audit service who would want to check and see if you have complied with the enabling legal and regulatory framework and been prudent in the use of financing as well as the national communication authority now the key players i mentioned earlier in my slide have designated the health systems as the protected computer and critical database the Electronic Transaction Act recognizes health systems as a protector and computer and critical database. And this has implications and, and meaning in terms of how you manage your, your healthcare institution. Section 35 of the Cyber Security Act also designates the health systems as a critical information infrastructure. And this also comes with some responsibilities in terms of IT governance and what you need to do. Now, I want you to take a long and hard look at this slide. Now, this slide gives you a complete snapshot of, 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 of the ecosystem. OK, so if you are an IT manager or you are, you are a director, whoever you are, and you are in charge of your IT uh, infrastructure or you are in charge of the hospitals, do you have any idea how to manage this ecosystem? OK, because I see this as a big monster is 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 huge and 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 if you are not clear in your mind what you need to do it, it's going to be chaotic you cannot be responsive when there's a legal suit you have no clue what to do when issues arise and you need to understand this because this is what must influence any decision you make if you want to recruit staff you need to do it. look at this if you want to build capacity, you will need to look at this ecosystem. If you are putting in place uh, some budgeting or financing uh, arrangement, you need to understand this. Now, when you look at this, what do you see? I share with you um, a story. I used to work with some neurosurgeons several years ago. Uh, I was the finance and admin manager in a hospital, and I was in charge of bailing and several other clinical services. Now, the neurosurgeons, I don't know what they saw in me, but they were also forcing me to try and read 
the films that uh, are generated by the CT scan. So before they do any surgery, they ask me to come. They put the film in a box uh, in, the, in the office, and they tell me, OK, so this is the tumor. Um, this tumor is huge. This tumor is small. And we we're, were kind of having the conversation. But the truth of the matter is, I wasn't seeing any tumor. So they would tell me, do you see the tumor? Then I, I asked, where? I don't see. They were, even when they pointed at it, I didn't see it. it they tried several times. I didn't, I didn't see it. So it was a source of frustration to me. So now when patients go for the CT scan and they bring the film, they will, then the neurosurgeon will call me, Sami. Then I will go there and said, okay, so now this is the tumor. Do you see it? Even though I don't see it, I say yes, I see it because I didn't want to uh, prolong the conversation. So I kept on saying yes, yes, yes. So one day, it just dawned on me that one of these days, the neurosurgeon is going to call me and give me uh, somebody's x ray uh, image from an MRI and then point out to him where the tumor is. So I had to go to him and tell him I was very uncomfortable with this arrangement of he calling me to his office and we will be trying to point out where a tumor is on uh, a patient's uh, head CT scan and and he looked at me and he was surprised that when it was even so glaring that uh, the tumor existed I, I couldn't see it. the truth of the matter is per my training I had not been trained in uh, identifying and spotting uh, uh, tumors on the form and so I had to uh, make him understand that my job description and my contract was for a position of finance and admin manager and not uh, didn't have any bearing on and clinical I'm, I'm bringing this example because you, you can be occupying a position you can be being a doing a job and and when you look at something like this you don't see anything you probably be seeing colors and uh, rounded images of what looks like a square and and and, and that's it. that is all you see but when i look at this i i see lots of stuff I see, I see danger. I, I see vulnerability and threats. I see a large attack surface. A large attack surface means that if I'm a hacker and I want to hit an institution that have this um, IT uh, infrastructure, I can pass it and pass it and pass it and pass it. I can also see that if you want to finance an ecosystem of this nature, you need to think through it. I, I can also see that you need varied competencies and skill sets to manage an infrastructure like this. You need network administrators, you need network engineers, you need database administrators, you need programmers, you need enterprise architects, you, you need security, IT security professionals. But if you don't know what you're about, you, you won't see anything and you'll be making uh, decisions that are not strategically aligned to what we hope to achieve, which is making sure we are leveraging technology uh, to provide the best of care for, for, for patients. So the essence of this webinar is to provide some guidelines and framework on how do you manage an infrastructure of this nature if you are a manager and if you are an IT professional, what role do you play to ensure that the patient-centric systems that we have implemented or we seek to implement which is aimed at providing quality of care to patients and all the best things that you can get from technology is managed effectively and efficiently. Okay, so to be able to manage what I spoken about, you need an enterprise architecture. Now, now people don't like to, or they want to hear the enterprise architecture uh, phrase or technology, but the question I ask myself, how the heck are you going to manage an infrastructure of this nature? Okay, so the, the, if you have an infrastructure like this, you, you need to think through. You need to do critical thinking. You, you need a lot of skill sets. And you cannot do this using common sense or naivety. You can't do that. You end up putting in place a system that will, would, would cause the uh, loss of patients. Okay, so an enterprise architecture, as I mentioned earlier, is, is a foundation for digital transformation. You do not undertake any digital transformation. Actually, it's a taboo, it's an abomination to talk about digital transformation without making reference to enterprise architecture. Because the enterprise architecture provides you 
with a conceptual blueprint on how you are going to move your technology from a manual state into a digital uh, platform that seeks to connect and ensure a seamless integration of your systems and also address what we refer to as interoperability. So the enterprise architecture is made up of four main domains, the business architecture, the data architecture, the applications architecture, and technology architecture. And it follows a logical uh, structure. First, you must understand the business in which you are operating. You must have a strategy. You must have an organizational chart. You must have defined your business processes. Once you are clear in your mind, you need to understand the kind of data that you require to get your business to function. So in my earlier, one of my earlier slides, I showed you the slides on data. So that is the kind of data that you require to get your healthcare institution to function. Once you have defined that kind of data, you need to also understand that those data constitute big data, and you need to have some analytical tool to make sense of the data that your infrastructure uh, generates. Now, once that is done, and of course, you determine our data sets and data schema and how to put in place your data governance structures, you need to figure out what kind of applications are going to run on your network. It's, 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 not, a, it's not just a good thing to have over 50 software applications in your ecosystem. They don't talk to each other. It's chaos. Managing it is, is a nightmare, and you don't want to go along that route. And then finally, what technology architecture would you want to put in place? What kind of hardware are you going to use? Uh, what are the hardware components? What security infrastructure are you going to put in place? Once you can logically define what your organization needs, then this slide that I showed you earlier on is, doesn't no longer become a monster or it doesn't look chaotic because you can take each of these boxes and put them under the architecture domains that have been I have I have identified. Okay, so now you have to create an enterprise architecture logical framework. Now, once again, based on your training, you might not find it very confusing, but then what the enterprise architecture does is the logical application. It connects the dots and, and works out the data flow. So you don't find people saying that, oh, I don't have the data and, and the data is offline and the data that I have or the software application that we have does not meet uh, our needs or we bought a software and the software does not meet our needs. You, you don't get to experience those situations if you follow a structured uh, methodical process in the adoption of technology. Okay, now to move in any digitalization undertaking, you must also understand that uh, digitalization is a process. And it also involves adoption of maturity models. You cannot start IT, uh, let's say, 10 years ago, and you're still where you are. You must plan to move from one step to another step. So you don't take 10 steps forward, another 20 steps backwards. It's, you can be prosecuted under the various legal regulatory framework. So once you have a very complicated uh, IT infrastructure, what do you need to do is to declare your mind what maturity models you are going to adapt in helping your institution to move from one stage to the other stage. You cannot and you must not forever be at stage one. You must not be talking about the same old thing or experiencing the same old situation over and over again. No, you these maturity models are operate at various levels. So the level one is the initial level where there's chaos, there's, there's confusion, there's no system in place. You must move from level one to level two, and move from level two to level three, and move from level three to four, and four to five. When you start at level one, you must not be at level one for 10, 15, 20 years, and, and it doesn't make sense to be there. Okay, and when you move from level three, from one to, and you are operating at level three, managers should not bring you down back to level one because they have no clue what they are supposed to do. Okay, so that is also one information that you must know, and without, a strong and well-defined IT governance structure. You'll be moving back and forth like the pendulum of an old grandfather's clock where you just do things at the whims of your caprices, and that is not uh, acceptable in the 21st century, especially in the healthcare uh, industry. Now, what the National IT Agency did was that 
as part of his digitalization agenda and as also part of his uh, guidance that is provided, uh, provided that the public sector institutions and the ministries uh, also would be required to put in place structures to help them in the execution of the IT project. So they decided or it was recommended that there are three categories of IT organizational structure that must exist at every ministry or public sector institution. And there's the IT unit, and there's the IT division or department, or, and finally, the IT directorate. So it's defined what condition under which an IT unit must operate. It defines the condition under which the IT division or department must operate and the competences required and the positions the people must hold. And finally, also the conditions under which an organization must operate and have an IT uh, directory. These, uh, what they call the structures, were taught through and, 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 and you don't have a right to change them or come up with your own and decide that this is what you want. No, you can't decide one morning and say you want a desk. You want to create an IT desk and, and, and call it whatever name you want because um, that is your vision. You can't, you can't do that. There are rules of engagement, and when you flout them, you would be prosecuted. There is also a career progression path. You know, in every profession, there's a career progression path. Okay, so uh, I have a final background. You can do your BSc, accounting option, MSc, finance, but there are also the technical route where you become a certified chartered uh, accountant. You can be a medical physician and also move and become specialized in uh, neurosurgery or pediatric care or dermatology. So the IT profession is like that. And you must plan how your IT people progress in your organization. Uh, IT is not a one-size-fits-all. It's, it's a whole full-time, big-time profession. And you must also be mindful of, of the fact that you require expertise. There are some expertise, if you do not have a well-defined organizational structure, they will never work in your organization. Okay, so to help MDAs and public sector institutions, the National IT Agency have designed and developed all these standards. There's the data center standards, there's the management of IT infrastructure standards, there's the land and one standard, there's also the data recovery and backup policy standard, there's the IT governance standards, and I recommend that for every uh, IT uh, manager and also managers, as well as the other standard, there's the systems and application standards, and also finally, there's the electronics records and data management standard. These standards are mandatory. They are not discretionary. So when the audit service and NATA and all the other institutions come and do a performance IT audit or IT audit or IT asset audit or any firm or audit, this is going to be the base document that they are going to apply. And I will encourage um, professionals in the ecosystem to be very uh, conversant with the content of these standards. Okay, so you also be audited. Just understand that your IT infrastructure will be audited. Either you're going to experience a forensic IT audit or performance IT audit, an IT asset audit, and an IT governance audit, and it must be clear in your mind who is going to be responsible for uh, leading these audits when they commence and, and the uh, governance arrangement in place. So when auditors come and audit, and they give an audit observation, what do you do? Do you just rubbish it because you think nobody can do anything to you? Or do you have a plan to implement the recommendations of the audit or you repeat them? You, you, the truth of the matter is when auditors make an observation, you fix it. You don't just abandon it and disregard it and go ahead and, and do times 10 or times 20 what the auditors recommended you must never do. Okay, so what are the cobalt mistakes to uh, avoid. I'm going to mention just a few. The first one you must know is that if you're a manager of any healthcare institution, you need to be mindful of the fact that the Minister of Communication is responsible for prescribing the minimum standards for the general manage management of your institution. It is not your uh, Director General, Deputy Director General, or Director or Manager, or your your any manager you, you can't do that and if you even if you decide to do that you need it to be ratified by the ministry of communication and digitalization we want to avoid um, the whole thinking is that it is very complicated 
and the complexity is demystified by uh, an adoption of frameworks and standards and guidelines and policies. Uh, uh, so if you don't have no clue what these frameworks and guidelines are, you have no business deciding how uh, structure should, an IT structure must function. You will be committing embarrassing blunders and, and you don't want to do that. And to, to avoid that, the Ministry of Communication and Digitalization in the Act, Electronic Transaction Act 5772, advise, admonish practitioners or adapters of technology to be mindful of the fact that when it comes to the management of critical uh, database, there are some minimum standards. And those standards are the ones I showed earlier on that have been provided by NITA. In addition to that, you must also be mindful of the fact that under the Data Protection Act 2012, Act 843, a patient can sue a hospital if it's convinced that the hospital uh, has not complied with um, the provisions of the Data Protection Act. And Section 77 allows the patient to do that or any other person whose uh, personal details of data has been collected. So the person can sue on his own behalf or on the behalf of another person. So I can sue on behalf of my friend, of my family, or member, or my, or my children. Okay, and when there is a legal suit, the Data Protection Act also makes provision for compensation. So where the individual can, can convince or is convinced or the Data Protection Commissioner after his, uh, his or her investigation provides that yes, there was a breach and, and there's evidence that the individual suffered damage, there has to be uh, compensation to the payment, uh, to the payment made to the patient. In addition to that, you are also not uh, required to undertake any IT decision making when you do not have the skill and care as a reasonable necessary under the circumstances. Don't be talking about networking and, and, and connectivity and Internet of Things when you don't have that training and experience. Don't. OK, it's clear it amounts to criminal negligence. If you want to be involved in IT, go to school, make sure you get some academic education, make sure you have some technical uh, certifications, and then you do have some proficiency in the field that you are talking about. And if it's health IT or healthcare, make sure you understand what health care IT is. And also the fact that if you make decisions that are not right, you could impact on, on, on patients in a negative manner. You must also know that um, if you make any decision that has a direct or indirect uh, impact on electronic uh, medical record, you commit an offense. And that offense, if you are convicted, you'll be fined a penalty of four, 5,000 penalty units. The last time I checked, the penalty unit was 12 cities. So it means 60,000 Ghana cities. Or you'll be you could serve a jail term of 10 years or both. So the law is very harsh when it comes to uh, breaches and, and, and impersonation of, of IT, the IT professionals or profession, and, and you don't have to uh, get caught in this uh, trap. OK, now this is also another clause which I think is very uh, dangerous because they say that a person who intentionally engages in a conduct. Now, it doesn't define what conduct is. So if you're a manager and you think because you're a manager, you can be intimidating people, you can be uh, up giving approval and, and forcing people to do things that they are telling you is unethical, it is not in line with uh, conventional IT practices, you might be mindful of the fact that someday you'll be found to have committed or be engaged in uh, misconduct. And when that happens, and the jail term or the penalty is also 5,000 penalty units and an imprisonment of not more than uh, 10 years and or both. Now, you'll be wondering why are the penalties very heavy? The penalties are heavy because IT is a major game changer when, when it comes to the delivery of care. Now, you can imagine what will happen if you are the boss of a major teaching hospital, a major regional hospital, and you make a decision that the results in the whole electronic health management system being shut down and, and, and what it means for patient care and, and also the running of the healthcare institution. So people who engage in that are heavily punished 
to serve as a deterrent to people who want to uh, ply that route. Okay, so I am done with my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, what I intend to do is, given the fact that uh, there's going to be a second uh, presentation and there could be some overlap, I will urge you to note down your questions so that after uh, Mr. C.K. Bruce's uh, presentation, uh, we would have uh, the full set of um, uh, questions so we will collectively uh, answer it. All right, so thank you very much for taking time off your busy schedule to participate in it. Thank you very much, Mr. Kwashi. Um, I salute you for being on time. That's the first thing. And the second thing, um, for the very insightful presentation, that was a very deep dive on IT governance as it is currently practiced, as we all know, in organizations and by our healthcare institutions gives us insight into best practices and IT governance frameworks that must be adopted by us. And as we all know, or I believe most of us know, that the understanding of IT governance is a critical success factor in the digital transformation of healthcare. Thank you very much, Mr. Kwashi. So um, we will have 10 minutes break, so we can go sip on some water and stretch our limbs to facilitate blood flow in our body. We'll come back here for our second uh, presentation, which um, I will be honored to introduce to you, the presenter, when we come back. So our 10 minutes break begins now. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back once again. I gave us 10 minutes to be able to sip on some water and stretch our limbs. So I believe it's past 10 minutes. If anybody falls behind time, you might have to stand outside the class while the lecture goes on. That's just by the way. So welcome back, everybody. Um, as you can see, projected is the profile of our next presenter. So you can briefly go through before I officially and humbly introduce him. Then he takes over. So I'll give you some few minutes to read through and know who is coming to talk to us next. Okay, so as we can all see, this is the profile of Mr. C.K. Bruce, our next presenter to speak with us. And this is just a summary of his profile. Trust me, this man's profile looks like a pamphlet that was sold to me when I was way back when I was in the university. But this is um, just a summary. So um, Mr. C.K. Bruce, I humbly and warmly welcome you. and. I want to give you the platform to speak with us as the rest of us finish up reading your... So, hello, Mr. C.K. I meet you and I salute you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope uh, you're having a, a, a very insightful morning. Uh, I like where... Uh, uh, okay, hang on, let me share my slides. Uh, I believe you can see my screen. Not yet. Oh, okay, hang on a second. Okay. Now you can okay. see my screen? Yes. Now we can okay. see your screen. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning again, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's, 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 um, it, it's a privilege to talk to uh, the people that we have on 
on online this this morning. I like where uh, Sam left off around some of the legislation. Uh, there was something that he didn't add around data protection. Uh, there's a there's a there's also a substantial penalty for a data breach from a data protection perspective. And you can be invited to spend six months free and in so on for a data breach under data protection. And, uh, you know, uh, patient data is considered uh, a very sensitive uh, data set that shouldn't be breached. And just with a courtesy look around some of the health institutions that I have visited, I, I can, I can, I can, I can conjecture that some of the heads of those institutions might be candidates for that invitation. So it, you know, it's something that needs to be looked at. Okay, one of the things that can save a chief executive or a director of a health institution is embarking on an governance, IT governance uh, journey or IT governance framework. And that would demonstrate your due diligence in doing the best that you can to safeguard your patient data. Okay, so let me go on. I'll try and, and uh, there's quite a lot to be, to be said around here. I'll try and be concise uh, to the point uh, trying to make it interesting. Uh, and I'll also try not to overload you with too much information. Okay. Uh, we've seen this. Okay. I want to start by juxtaposing some of the health issues, information security issues in healthcare. Okay. Uh, we need to understand that healthcare comes from two perspectives, okay? Other organizations just have management information systems, okay? But from a healthcare perspective, you have the management information systems and you have the clinical information systems, the clinical information systems, which also covers, uh, you know, devices and uh, uh, other uh, uh, monitoring uh, devices, machines that are that are attached to patients in and diagnostics, so many. So there's quite some different dimensions and and different perspectives that we need to look at. Okay, so some of the issues are universal. Ransomware, for instance, are uh, you know. It affects all of us, and uh, it seems in in other jurisdictions. And I know that uh, it is it is it, it it has been hitting a lot of companies in Ghana. Ransomware is ravaging companies. Okay, and because of the perceived uh, lower level of information security in health centers, there seems to be. Uh, a, a significant rise of ransomware attacks for healthcare uh, institutions. Okay, it's also another problem around COVID. COVID has brought so much focus to you know to 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 healthcare. So much uh, uh, you know uh, uh, noise around healthcare. So it invariably becomes a target. Okay from uh, a scams, phishing, and other uh, cyber fraud perspective. Again, COVID-19 has, has, has significantly increased uh, these cyber types of cyber attacks because of the level of uncertainty that COVID and unease and confusion that COVID has, has brought. And you would know that these individuals, these undesirable individuals thrive on confusion, uncertainty, and uh, 
uh, uh, uh, unsettled environment. So ransomware viruses are, are seriously on the rise. Okay. One of the important things and, and looking at the ecosystem that Sam has described, it is extensive with so many devices. Okay. Uh, vulnerability management becomes very critical. We need to realize that all these devices, they seem to be hardware. We can call them hardware devices, but every device has software within it. Okay. It is the software within that device, that, uh, that uh, hardware that makes it do what, what is it meant to do. And not keeping that devices software up to date is, has, can have very serious uh, repercussions to, you know, to, to the effective application and use of that device. Okay, you can imagine uh, an, an MRI scanner not functioning well and you not being aware of that. Okay, and that brings me to the other point, calibration. In the normal world, we will be talking about configuration, okay? But within health uh, healthcare devices, the issue of calibration comes in. And I, uh, before I got involved in much in healthcare information security, the only uh, thing I talk about calibration is is when I'm buying petrol. So if there's a miscalibration on a in a in a uh, petrol uh, station. The only result would be that I'm paying a little bit more for the petrol that I'm buying. And yes, I'll get angry a bit. And uh, if 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 I get to know, I'll get angry a bit. But in this arena, it it, it is not just a few a few more Ghana cities that I'm going to pay. It's the life and death matter if we don't have proper calibration, okay? So vulnerability management and calibration is critical on uh, healthcare uh, information systems and devices. We need to ensure that the, you know, the, the device is set up properly. We need to ensure that it is totally up to date. We need to ensure that we have proper relationship with the vendor so that updates are coming okay uh, those are one of the, the 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 confusion or the the lack of awareness that a lot of healthcare professionals might have that once we buy a device then that's it we don't need to do anything else around it there's no maintenance maybe the maintenance the maintenance requirements that that are that is in their minds is just a matter of cleaning it and uh, uh, you know making sure certain parts are available and that's it. Okay, far more. As I said, the software that is running within that device must also be managed. Okay, so vulnerability management and calibration, you know, becomes a very very critical aspect in the management of uh, uh, IT technology assets. In a, in a healthcare environment. Then we have behavior, culture, okay? Uh, you can understand that healthcare professionals already have a big headache on their, on their minds, you know, the care of their uh, patients, okay? Uh, keeping on top of those issues can be, can be sucking, can be very, very tiring. And uh, uh, I have, I have uh, relatives, in fact, my, one of my nephews is a doctor and, you know, after a shift, you, you could, you, I mean, you can imagine. And, 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 and that is one thing. I keep wondering why doctors have 12 hour shifts, uh, you know, and things like that. So at the end of the shifts, yes, a, a doctor can be, can be and a nurse can be very, very tired. Okay. So, we are adding awareness of the use, the safe use of uh, uh, devices to that headache. So you, you can realize that it is important that security culture 
within healthcare professionals must be ingrained. So it, it must be something that is developed early on in their profession so that they understand the nature, the, this, these possible issues around the devices and the, the, the applications that they're using. So behavior, the organizational culture, the professional culture of healthcare professionals around safety of uh, technology uh, uh, devices and solutions is very, very critical. Okay. Network, network security is, is also very critical. Okay. Uh, again, all these are attached. These devices can be attached to, to a network. Okay. Network availability becomes critical. Okay, if the network is not available, then uh, obviously it could have a, a significant impact. Okay, telehealth is completely reliant on communication networks. So the security, the, the continual availability of networks in a healthcare center is, can become a life and death issue. Then we have an issue of shadow IT. Shadow IT is, is, is the existence of IT assets that are outside the purview of IT management. So th th these are devices, software applications that are being used privately by the you know the uh, professionals and people within that institution okay now this can bring serious problems and the nature of healthcare where there's considerable uh, uh, personal research uh, uh, healthcare professionals are always trying to find new ways in in taking care of uh, so there's quite a lot of personal devices that may be connected to the uh, uh, institutions information systems. Okay, how are we managing those devices? Can they become a vector for a cyber attack because they might not have the the I mean the right configurations the the, 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 the right protection that is required to ensure that you know, any cyber crime or cyber issue does not pass through those devices. Okay, so it becomes quite a possible problem. Okay, in these times of uh, uh, a lot of cloud-based uh, applications, again, there could be a lot of applications that people have subscribe to and are using without uh, the knowledge of the IT management. How, how is the data in those applications being protected? How are they under the data governance requirements? I'll talk about data governance a little bit later. Okay, so shadow IT really brings up a myriad of possible problems that that always needs to be looked at, and the, and there must be, a, you know, proper governance uh, activities to ensure that that is fully under control. Then, obviously, within healthcare, data privacy is a major issue. is a major, major issue because of the nature of the data that is being uh, uh, protected there and they're being used and protected there. Now, I want to focus a lot on, I mean, come to talk about mobile devices, okay? COVID-19 has brought about uh, the use of mobile devices in in managing a lot of issues. Seriously, without mobile devices, it, 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 you know, we would not have been able to scale up so much in being effective in the care 
of patients. Okay, there have been so many uh, different applications that are managing critical information. Uh, perhaps COVID information was perhaps one of the very well managed, uh, uh, you know, information that was uh, gathered very quickly globally to constantly give us the information about uh, infection rates, uh, you know, and uh, death rates and, and all that, okay. But unfortunately, uh, because of the speed of deployments, the, 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 you know, the wideness of its use, it, 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 it comes along with challenges. Data security, for instance, okay? So many devices connected. Uh, what is, how, how do we know that, you know, the things, the data are being entered correctly? Uh, cross infections, devices, are they being wiped down? How and being exchanged, you know, in a very stressed circumstances, people might not have the time to, to completely disinfect a device before handing it over to, 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 to somebody else. Physical security issues, the devices being so portable that you know they can be missing, they can be stolen, they can be you know misplaced. Uh, the, the, the device might still have access to critical data, to critical systems, you know, so uh, physical security over the device becomes very, very, uh, you know, important. Uh, even the deployments, okay? Uh, do we have any mobile device management applications embedded on those devices so that if they do get missing, we, are, we, we, we have the ability and capability of uh, uh, keeping the data that is that is available on that device safe, okay? Privacy, again, becomes a very serious issue and then integrity of the data, okay? So mobile devices have, have, have served us well in this era, but the, you know, the speed of deployment, the lack of proper governance uh, proper policies, proper control around it during the planning and actual de de deployment obviously has brought up a lot of issues. Okay. So what are some of the key controls that we can, uh, you know, think about? Okay. One of the key things, because of, as, I'm, as I spoke earlier, the fact that there are so many devices unknown to the IT management. A zero trust environment is important. That any device that is connected must actually prove who, 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 who they are, basically. Okay, we need to ensure that every device being connected is known to the network, okay? So that we 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 can prevent rogue devices connecting to you know to the network and thereby not becoming a vector for a cyber attack. Network segmentation is always is also very very critical. Okay, uh, let me discuss that with incident response. Incident response is the capability and ability of uh, IT, the uh, uh, incident response team to be able to respond to any incident that happens. Okay, now in the in in the real world where we are, uh, in other industries, when you have an incident, you just disconnect. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay, we we call that containment. Okay, we are trying to contain the problem. And one of the easiest way to contain a, an, an, uh, a, 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 a possible 
uh, developing emerging cyber attack is to disconnect the, the device, the computer from the network. We can't do that, you know, that simply in a healthcare institution because that, that device, that network, that uh, computer might be linked to uh, 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 a patient. So it is not that simple at all in just disconnecting devices or disconnecting, uh, you know, taking a local area network off the wide area network. It is definitely not that simple, okay? So network segmentation, i.e. dividing up the network into smaller uh, logical uh, areas in which to ensure that if one subnet or sub area of a network is compromised, it, it doesn't automatically make other areas of the network available. Thereby, we are minimizing the, the, the exposure, the attack surface of that network, okay? So uh, uh, segmenting, ensuring that we have bits and pieces of subnets, maybe per ward, per unit, is critically important to reduce the, 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 the exposure of the network, the attack surface, to any possible problem. And that's a, and that's a very, very key uh, uh, control to have in a health institution's network, okay? In the real world, yes, we want to segment critical assets, but uh, health care results can result in the death of an individual, okay? Uh, identity and access management, I am, we call it I am, is critical to ensure that uh, access control to data is being practiced, okay? Uh, as I said, uh, uh, the uh, patient data is, is always seen as very, very critical. So one of the best ways to, to, to protect that data is to have a very robust access control regime supported by an IAM, uh, uh, an identity management system that would ensure that the people who have access are really who they say they are, okay? Cultural change, I have, I have mentioned it as a problem. So, Having a, a deliberate, focused uh, message tailored awareness program for healthcare professionals is very important within a healthcare institution. We need to ensure that uh, you know the healthcare professionals completely understand the the, the possible issues with the devices that they are uh, using, okay? It's important that between the healthcare professional and the IT management or the information security professionals, there is a common risk view. There is a common understanding of the risks that are faced by the use of, that, of those devices that there's a poss possible repercussion of not having proper calibration. There's a possible repercussion of not having uh, uh, a, 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 a software updated within a device, okay? Healthcare professionals must understand that so that, uh, uh, you know, when diagnostic re reports come out, you know, uh, if need be, they can take it with a pinch of salt and you know, do what they have to do to ensure that this diagnostic outcome is what it is meant to be. Them knowing the possibilities around the, the, the things that can cause a malfunction of those devices. And uh, IT asset management, again, as I, as I mentioned, uh, is, 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 is to ensure that 
all the assets that are within the environment are well known, are completely uh, inventoried. We, are, we have full information around them. Okay. So these are some of the uh, controls that would, would be necessary, some of the controls that would be necessary within the uh, uh, healthcare institution. Now, all these are quite some work in trying to ensure that these uh, uh, issues, the risks that we've talked about, the controls that we are talking about remain current, okay? And that is where we need IT governance. IT governance must come in to, 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 to ensure that these, all these sets of activities and all the things that uh, Sam spoke about, that we are having it all under control. And those are uh, the, the uh, uh, objectives of IT governance. So IT governance has three components. Okay, leadership, structure, processes. Okay, and it is not one against the expense of the other two. No, all three, all three are critical to have in place to ensure that uh, we are we are having a well planned, well secured, well resourced environment. Okay. Uh, to keep focus, I am just going to focus today on leadership because leadership uh, is, 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 is actually very critical to the whole success. Okay. Now, leadership is core. We expect the leadership, i.e. management of, of, uh, of, the, of the organization to be to be to be fully committed to the uh, compliance to the various processes required to ensure that IT is bringing value to the organization. Okay, uh, we call that management commitment. Okay, now. It's so easy to have IT going off on a tangent. Uh, a lot of people feel that IT is a is is a very confusing uh, area. They don't know. It is it is things that I don't want to know. So leave it to the uh, IT professionals to to do what they want to do. Okay. Now we need to understand that IT, information technology, technology in itself is a support to certain processes and activities. And those processes and activities are owned by the people who are, 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 are delivering on certain services within the organization. So the understanding by those individuals as to what the technology does is critical. And effectively, that is what IT governance is about. The fact that the decision to acquire a IT technology or a device should not be the should not be made by the IT, but it should be made by the internal user. Okay. So what software we're going to buy, if we're going to buy HR software. We would expect that the HR manager is closely involved in, 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 in that acquisition. Okay. So similarly, in, in, a, in a health environment, that should also be the case. Okay. So the understanding of exactly what is being bought or what the technology does or what is in it i.e. what software, what, what uh, uh, platform, all that information should be clear to the uh, uh, service delivery person, okay? 
I was going to say business to the business because that's that's the uh, terminology that we use in uh, other industries. Okay, so please please permit me uh, uh, if I use that that word. So when I say the business, then I'll, I'm I'm referring to the healthcare professionals because they are delivering on their business. Okay, so that commitment from leadership management to understand what the technology that they are buying does and how it's going to impact is very, very key. Okay. We need to have dedicated, okay? There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, quite an issue around, which I have noticed, around healthcare administration, okay? Uh, I would, I would, I would take it that healthcare, healthcare administration should be a profession on its own, so that there are professionals who all they do is manage and administer healthcare institutions. Uh, the trajectory of everything now is going towards digitalization. And there's quite a lot to understand within digitalization. There are quite a lot of dynamics. There's quite a lot of uh, adoption requirements. There's quite a lot of uh, specifications that needs to be understood. That needs to be juxtaposed to the management requirements and the administrative requirements of the institution. And I, 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 I keep wondering why a doctor would also add all that to his, to his or her already very difficult uh, profession of, of knowing all the clinical medical things that they need to know around uh, you know, keeping uh, the patients alive and, and well. So the point I'm trying to, to, to dive at is that the practice of having uh, uh, doctors as head, the administrative heads of institutions, I, I find it funny. I find it difficult because there's so much work these days to be done, so much decision, so much, so much uh, things to contend with from a management perspective. Managing an, an uh, institution these days with so many, uh, uh, you know, different facets of things that are converging around your management decisions, uh, you know, are very difficult, okay? It brings me to the risk orientation. We expect that decisions are made based on some risk assessments. Okay, so a leader, a, 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 you know, a leader with IT governance perspectives has to be risk oriented. We need to understand the risks in the various uh, technologies that we are buying. We need to understand the risks around the devices, the risks in not uh, taking care of them, the risks in adoption of so many new ways of, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 healthcare. So we need to understand it. We need to ensure that the, we, and when I say we, I'm, I'm referring to the institution, that there is the capability to be able to manage all those uh, uh, you know, applications, devices, technologies, and and you know, all that we there's 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 proper capability to be able to to you know to fully manage it. It becomes tricky if we just embark on uh, the use of certain technologies without having the associated in-depth knowledge around it. Okay, there's, 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 there's the significant advancement. I mean, for example, the things that can be done with AI is, is, can be mind boggling, okay? 
we need to ensure that those 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 amazing things is not misused or misconstrued or misunderstood by somebody resulting in putting uh, a patient in danger. The last thing I'd like to talk about in leadership is the tone, tone at the top, okay? The tone at the top dictates the tone around the whole organization, okay? So if the, the, the top management are properly risk-oriented, then we would have the whole organization being uh, you know, risk oriented because that is the culture being set from the very, very top. Okay, and and uh, uh, understanding the 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 cultural makeup of an organization, we know that is the tone at the top that sets the behavior patterns, that sets the cultural the uh, the organizational culture of the organization. So we could have a fantastic awareness, making sure that people, everybody within the organization are aware of the possible uh, uh, risk issues, deployment issues, the use issues. And if the tone at the top is not right, then uh, uh, all that awareness will fall on, on unfertile grounds and not germinate into the type of culture that we want to have within the organization. One of the tools for leadership are the policies. And that's very, very key, okay? Policies uh, represents the presence of leadership everywhere within the organization, okay? It provides the mandate for action. So if uh, an IT officer who is administrating the firewall, for instance, needs to block certain things, his mandate will be derived from the policies. If he is going to allow, uh, is going to grant access his mandate is going to uh, be derived from the policies which has set the access, con access approval process, okay? So it is critical to ensure that everything that is done within the organization is properly mandated, okay? Policies are approved at the highest level of the organization. So we say that it is providing man, uh, the mandate and is also providing direction, okay? So if I encounter a circumstance or a situation, what do I do? I, I, I find direction in policies, okay? So we will need to know that uh, 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 before I can connect my personal uh, laptop to the uh, organizations, the institutions, uh, network, these are the things that I need to do, okay? I will need to go to uh, the IT management department. They might need to install some software on it that would, you know, protect my laptop and protect the institution's network. Okay, they would need to ensure that I am oriented properly around fiscal security. I, uh, uh, the, the laptop is mine. However, I need to ensure that there's a screensaver that kicks in within uh, three minutes if I am away from my laptop. Okay, those are all provided by policies. It's also a mandate being, provi being, 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 being provided by the policies, it's showing me what I need to do, okay? It provides controls. It addresses risks, okay? So a full policy regime is very, very important, okay? And uh, subsequent slides, I will explain 
how the whole governance structure aids in ensuring that the policies are always up to date. Because once a policy is no longer up to date, then it might actually cause more harm than good. Okay, so once we have policies, then those policies must constantly, constantly be in the, 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 the right state of reflecting what exactly should be happening on the ground to the nature of the environment and how we need to be working during that, that, that specific time. Okay, so policies are critical tools for leadership to be able to properly lead and manage the, and govern the uh, 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 healthcare institution as it is. We also need to establish accountability, okay? One of the critical things to ensure that things are done properly is to clearly outline what is the accountability and responsibility of any group or any specific uh, function within the, the organization. So IT governance, the governance sets objectives, as I said. So through the policies, it provides uh, direction. Okay, it provides the grounds for uh, measurements of performance. Okay, uh, it is through uh, the measurement of performance that we can improve. Okay, Sam spoke about the maturity models and the fact that uh, there might be some organizations who have been on the same level for 15, uh, you know. Uh, 15 years, okay. It's not a joke, it's true. I've, I have literally experienced it, okay. I, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that I do is implement ISO 27001, which is a framework, which is a framework based on ma maturity models, okay. And we've gone into institutions and we realized that there is zero improvement, okay. There's zero processes, mechanisms to achieve improvement, okay? If you are not measuring, if you are not, if you don't have KPIs that you are keeping and measuring, then you will not improve. It's simple as that. There must be the, 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 the measurement regime in place which we call it quantitatively managed, okay, in place to be able to improve. If you want to manage, you need to measure, okay? If there's no measurement, then it is, uh, uh, we are just doing uh, business as usual and just moving from day to day without anything getting better. And yes, companies have been at that at the same level for years and years on end and definitely that must stop okay with with the use the more the more that we are using uh, uh technologies it really changes the dimensions it really brings things into different perspectives and it really raises the risks which we need to ensure that all these risks are fully guarded against to ensure that we are using these technologies ethically, properly, uh, to the greater benefit of the organization. And that is one thing that IT governance would, you know, would bring. So IT governance sets objectives, strategic directions, et cetera. IT management translates all these mandates into action, okay? So IT management's strategy follows the organization strategy through IT governance. 
Okay. So we need to be able to manage the environment through a certain strategic direction so that deployment of devices is controlled. It is done within a, uh, a environment of capability to ensure that uh, the, you know, the, the, the total benefits that can be derived from those assets are achieved. The last accountability is IT security. Okay, so we have deployed the uh, environment. How do we ensure that it is secure, safe and secure to use? How do we ensure that if I'm plugging a, uh, a patient to a monitoring device, the readings that I'm getting are accurate? so that I can trust the readings and I do not have to have, uh, you know, other, other ways to measure or I shouldn't express uh, concern or worry about the effectiveness of those uh, devices, okay. So clearly we have established uh, accountability here, accountability of setting the direction, accountability of deploying and accountability of secure, okay. We also need to understand the stakeholders, okay. So the stakeholders, who are who are the people? Number one, the uh, stakeholder are the investors, okay. The administrators, the healthcare professionals, they are the ones who are managing the the the, the, the management information and managing the clinical information to be able to deliver on what they're doing, okay? They have a, have, have, a, have, a, have a very important stake in ensuring that all this environment is well controlled, well managed, so that the information that they are having can be trusted, okay? Then we have the controllers, the audits, the risk compliance people, okay? Uh, right now, the uh, legislative and regulatory environment in Ghana is solid, is really solid. We have, we, have, we have all the required laws and regulations. Well, maybe in the health sector, regulations might not be, might not be that, uh, that, uh, that, that strong, but, the legislative environment in the country as looking at the, ma the management and security of information is there. All we have to do is to comply with it. And that's it, okay? So we need enforcement, okay? Uh, uh, as usual, that has always been an issue with, with, you know, with us, okay? We have the laws, but the enforcement, it, it, you know, sometimes might not be forthcoming. But there's all indication, things are changing. Okay, compliance, compliance is becoming a big headache for managers, okay? Uh, and once we comply with things, then we are, we are creating a safe environment, okay? Then we have the deliverers, okay? So uh, uh, audit, risk and compliance, uh, finance, HR are the supports and ensures that all the uh, uh, deployments of technologies are being done within a certain uh, uh, manner which ensures uh, success at the end of it, okay? So the deliverers, the IT management and service providers, we say service providers now because a lot of uh, uh, IT services now are being outsourced, okay? So from an IT, IT management perspective, the question of good vendor management becomes important. And again, that should be something within the purview of administrators for them to understand that not all IT services are within 
the immediate management uh, scope of IT management. Okay, some are being delivered as a service, so we have supplier relationship that we need to look at. Okay. Then the final uh, stakeholders are the service recipients, the patients. Okay, uh, and always that is what makes the difference in uh, healthcare. Okay, other industries, the 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 failure of an IT system might result in uh, if it's a bank, some money being uh, you know uh, uh, misappropriated. If it's manufacturing, uh, it might result in a uh, product defect, okay? But if it's healthcare, it might result in a death, and that is unacceptable. So it really does bring very different dimensions, and we have the patients as stakeholders, the service recipients as stakeholders in an IT governance uh, uh, infrastructure. <clears throat> now, to be successful in rolling out IT governance, you need a framework. You need a you 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 need a standard to follow. Okay, and uh, in healthcare, one of the standards that we know is HIPAA. HIPAA. Okay, so it's something that you know. Uh, uh, might be the first thing that comes to the the, the fore when we are we are looking for a, for a framework to uh, uh, implement. Okay, a framework is a set of processes, policies, procedures that that have been you know uh, designed and when adopted would give you a guaranteed outcome of managing your uh, 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 environment properly, okay? So a framework is a best practice, i.e. It's been, it's been used all over the globally for years, it's been developed. So it's in a way that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, okay? Uh, easy adoption select a framework, adopt it, and you will realize that all you, you don't have to feel around yourself. Everything is there for you, okay? Now, the thing is that HIPAA is not a framework. HIPAA is a law. HIPAA is a law in the US, okay? So yes, it does outline a lot of things, uh, again, focused on the privacy of, uh, of uh, patient data, yeah? but the point is that before you can uh, ensure the privacy of the patient data, you need to put your house in order. So uh, effectively implementing any information security uh, framework results in good value delivery for the environment. So all your technologies, devices, everything would be giving you the value that you expect from those assets, okay? So HIPAA is there, but as I said, it's a law, it is not a framework, and we need a framework to be able to implement HIPAA or HIPAA, HIPAA-like uh, uh, legislation in a country, okay? ISO 27001, and ISO 27701 are the frameworks that would enable complete compliance with HIPAA, okay? So if uh, a health institution wants to ensure that they are using HIPAA as a guide in knowing what to do, implementing 27001, which is information an information security management system, and 27701 is a privacy information management system, okay? Put them together and you've covered all the requirements that you need for HIPAA, okay? Okay, so in trying to 
draw to uh, the end of my presentation. I think I have just about three, 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 two or three slides more. We need to understand the three lines of defense, okay? And I'm sure that uh, a lot of you know the three lines of defense, um, and you know you've heard about it, okay? So the three lines of defense is the is is the resultant uh, environment, one of the resultant environments from uh, 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 the option of IT governance, okay? So you, you will have an environment that is, uh, you know, constantly safe from all risks, that all the possible risks from all perspectives to ensure that your environment is safe. So the first line of defense is the operational management. So that's where the, uh, clinical, clinical uh, uh, adoption of technologies will be. That's where the uh, initial data capture would be. That's where uh, uh, you know uh, uh, all the payment systems uh, that uh, Sam described. Most of the things that Sam described will be found in the first line of defense. That is also where most of the policies live. Okay, so that's the front line. That's where all the action is, okay? So when we buy a device, we are buying it, we are deploying it to be used in the first line of defense, okay? So that's where most of the things happen, okay? So you can see we have the devices, we have the applications, we have the network, we have the data, and we have the users all there, okay? So we need the policies, to, to, to be able to guide us in doing things in a manner that is, that, I mean, that is according to the expectations of the organization, okay? Then the second line of defense is risk management, okay? I mentioned the importance of having, making the right decisions within the uh, administration of an institute, okay? We need to be able to do constant risk assessment of the environment, constant risk assessment of both internal and external environment to see whether the devices, the applications, the technologies that we have are being used in a way, are being managed in a way that uh, uh, ensures their safety, okay? So if there's any change in environment, okay? So for instance, COVID-19, COVID-19 was sprang upon us in uh, uh, in, uh, in March, 2020, okay? It just jumped on us, okay? Through a risk assessment, we would fully understand what changes we need to make in response of this totally new environment that we have, that we need to operate in, that we need, still need to be caring for, for, you know, for uh, our patients, despite the very challenging, now challenging environment, okay? It cannot be business as usual. We cannot, we, we we could not have been carried on as is in such a massive change within the environment, okay? And exactly, to, to know exactly how to respond can only be done through, through uh, uh, a risk management capability, okay? Then we move to the third line of defense. The third line of defense is the audit and review. So we need to be able to check whether the various processes in the first line of defense are efficient and effective. We need to ensure whether the policies, the controls that have been put in place are doing, are doing what we expected them to do. They are helping us achieve 
what we expected them to achieve. Okay. Uh, we are checking whether the environment still requires those controls. Okay. So, for instance, we might have a a, a uh, diagnostic device that is not smart. I, it's not connected to any network, okay? Then we have acquired one. So it means that the requirements in using that diagnostic device will change, okay? So it's through an audit that will discover that, look, that environment that's, that's, that those, the types of devices that we've used is, has changed. Therefore, the, the, the management requirements around it must also change. Okay, now these three lines of defense, working in consonants is critical to ensure that everything within IT governance is working and working smoothly, okay? It's, it ensures that the uh, first line of defense is fully aware of risk management, is fully aware that before we can do, we can go and buy a device, we need to do a risk management and assessment to see number one, do we have the capability to manage this uh, device? What do we need to do to be able to ensure that this device is being managed well and, and capably, okay? We just can't don't just get up and acquire, get new technologies. Are we using it properly? All these uh, in a step-by-step -step wise would be achieved <clears throat> through the effective adoption of the three lines of defense. Okay, now let me round off. I need, I need to mention the uh, data and information, okay? Because uh, data and uh, information is critical for the future of uh, healthcare, okay? Uh, to enable us uh, diagnose, uh, to enable us have proper uh, perspectives on things. We need data, okay? So data is a singular, singular piece of data, patient ID, blood pressure reading, okay? Information uh, management or information governance is question of aggregation of a lot of data, okay? So we need big data. Big data has become very, very important to enable us have better insight into diseases and the way uh, disease uh, uh, prevalence and things like that, okay? So data governance, which will ensure proper intrinsic and conceptual quality of the data is critical so that we, we know that the data that we are getting to ensure information governance. So um, uh, the aggregation, of the data in information governance can be done by an individual or can be done by an AI system, either way. Okay, but as we uh, uh, clearly see, more and more of these technologies are helping us to effectively extract a lot of intelligence from the data that we are, that we are gathering over the, over the time and over the years, okay? So the importance of data governance and data governance can only be effective if we have a proper compliance ready environment is critical for proper information get governance and information use, which would in turn be uh, the, you know, the future of medical care. So to have an example of an IT governance roadmap, okay, what quickly an organization can do to set them on the journey is one, set up a steering committee. 
It's a high level committee that would oversee the whole implementation and the direction of the implementation of IT governance. We need to choose a framework. You cannot do IT governance without a framework, okay? There are a few frameworks around, okay? Depending on the maturity of the organization, you know, you know that should be one of the criteria in selecting which framework that you are going to use, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Looking at the typical maturity of organizations in Ghana, uh, in my mind, ISO 27001 is the best framework to start off with. Okay, it's to provide you with a with an organized, structured approach in setting up the processes and the structures needed to be able to set up to to you know to adopt. IT governance within your, 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 your environment, okay? Then after maturity as set in, COVID would be a very, very good to further strengthen the uh, uh, maturity of the processes that you've implemented with ISO 27001, okay? Then there are other frameworks that support other disciplines, for example, you need something for project management. You need something for uh, resource management. You need something for uh, 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 IT service management, okay? Again, most uh, these other frameworks in the other disciplines can be mapped on to ISO 27001. Then we need to define roles and responsibilities. We need to ensure that people know exactly what they need to do, what they need to be doing, where they need to focus, and they have the mandates behind them to do what they have to do, okay? With a clearly defined uh, job description, okay? Uh, <clears throat> those roles, those roles would, would also would have to be evaluated to ensure that the person is doing what they have to do with certain objectives in mind, okay? Then we can actually implement the framework. Then once the framework has been implemented, we immediately need to look to be measuring and improving. As I said, with, when, if you don't measure, you cannot improve. You need measurement to be able to improve. And without improvement, then the uh, value, the business value that you would want, the value for the organization will not be achieved, will not be found, will not be derived. Okay. So this could be an example of a roadmap, a very simple roadmap, a high level roadmap to follow, to be able to, uh, uh, adopt uh, IT governance. <clears throat> so in ending, ladies and gentlemen, uh, IT governance is, 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 is a must have. It is not a, ni a, a, a nice to have, it's not a may have, it's a must have, okay? Uh, uh, we cannot do without being without uh, digitalization. It's impossible now. Okay, the whole trajectory of everything of any industry is moving towards a total uh, adoption of of uh, digital solutions. So we need to ensure that the right governance structures, the right governance processes, and the right type of leadership exists to ensure that uh, we are able to derive maximum benefit from it. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. CK Bruce.
that was um, very intense. So those who came late and had connectivity issues. So Mr. CK spoke about some of the information security issues and healthcare and some necessary controls on the health healthcare institutions. IT governance activities and its components. He spoke exclusively about leadership, considering commitment, dedication, risk orientation, and tone, and also establishing accountability and the lines of defense and risk management. He also spoke about data governance and information governance and IT governance and what it does. So at this juncture, if any of us have questions, I would give you the opportunity and the privilege to ask your questions. So please, if you have questions, kindly use the hand feature to raise your hand, then we can offer you the platform to ask your question. Questions and suggestions and other inputs are welcome, please. Okay, so um, I see Madam Theresa's hand up. Kindly unmute yourself and ask your question or your input. Thank you very much. And we appreciate the two presenters, Mr. Bruce and Mr. Kwashi, for the great presentation. Please, my challenge is um, how do we equip people in the IT space and health with all these that have been presented with today by the two. I, I see a very big challenge, though ignorance is not an excuse, but how, how do we get people to know? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, please, who is your question directed to? Uh, please to both. To both presenters, then even to Nita, I don't know the role of all these and the role of all in getting people equipped because we are in an IT world and those of us in health, we have so many things on our hands. But I believe most people don't know what they are doing. So how do we equip people? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so... Mr. C.K. Bruce, would you please help us answer this yeah, question? Sure. Uh, uh, I really appreciate that question. I really appreciate that question. And it, it does go to the very core of what IT governance is all about, okay? Yes, there's a lot there, but when we start breaking it down, you will realize that what each person needs to know within their area of, of uh, responsibility will not be that much, okay? One of the things that IT governance would, would uh, roll out is to outline what your, your responsibilities are, and that includes how you expect it to behave. So, for instance, one of your responsibilities would be to keep your password safe, okay? Now, that will not be, I mean, would not be too complex. 
We also need to ensure that you understand that you cannot divulge any patient data, okay? Now, we will need to tell you, yes, uh, if the information is on a clipboard, it will be easy for you to understand how I will, pre how, what I should do to ensure that nobody sees that data. But then the dimensions changes when the uh, data becomes electronic, okay? So in that arena, we, we will tell you that, then put a screensaver on, on, your, on your device. So, or if you are moving away from the device, activate the screensaver, okay? So in the final analysis, you would realize that what you need to know is just a matter of what I need to know around the devices that I handle. You don't need to know how to segment a network. You don't need to know that, okay? Those, th that information, that, 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 I mean, that's, that responsibility rests with a network manager, okay? You don't need to know uh, how to ensure that, uh, you know, uh, data when captured is, we, we, we will ensure the integrity of the data, okay? All we need to tell you is that if you're entering data and a certain message pops up, this is what you're supposed to do, okay? So the IT governance framework has, will already break down all these various processes, responsibilities, and everything would be put in, 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 in a way and manner to ensure that everybody knows what to do. That is why the framework is important. Okay, so as I said, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are frameworks out there that when the institution adopts, puts everything where they should be and makes it easy for uh, uh, everybody to be doing what they are supposed to be doing. Okay, so that is why I, I, you know, I spoke about leadership. Now, if you are the director of the institution, definitely your responsibility will be lined, outlined and the things that you need to be doing, you know, would be known to you, okay? Obviously, that would be different from the uh, senior nurse, okay, or the junior doctor, okay? What the junior doctor needs to know within his or her responsibility will be known to her, okay? And that's how it, was, it, it, will, it will be set up. So it looks daunting, okay? It looks daunting, but adopting a framework simplifies and makes everything easy to adopt. I hope I have... Uh, I have, I have, I have removed any apprehension and fear within you. Yes, thank you very much. Grateful. Okay. Any other questions, please? Suggestions? Okay. So, um, Mr. Bruce, please, I have a question directed to you. And it is, if an institution had the ecosystem Mr. Kwashi spoke about, presented about, what recommendation will you suggest in managing it? Uh... I mean, I, 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 I think my answer will be similar. That's, you know, adopting a framework would answer that question, okay? So, uh, uh, 
you know, some of those technologies are devices. How do you manage a device? There's, you know, there's the, there's the best practice way. Some of those would be applications. How do you manage an application? There's a best practice way. So we have best practices for, for I mean, for each component, each uh, assets of the ecosystem. Okay. So, so, so very much the, the, the fact that we must not reinvent the wheel is important. There's no need, okay? The frameworks are there to be adopted, okay? Which would ensure that all the compliance requirements and all the best practice requirements. So the fact that, I mean, uh, we need to ensure that the patient data is safe throughout the value, the value chain, okay? So the privacy management system, the information security management system would ensure that once you adopt that framework, okay? So yes, I mean, what Sam described is extensive and it is very worrying if it's being deployed without control, okay? And if it's being de deployed without control, it brings a lot more risks than we are trying to address, okay? So uh, uh, I can't overemphasize more the importance and the need of a framework to be adopted, which would guide in ensuring that things are well controlled, well organized, and well secured. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, CK. I would also want to add um, uh, to what uh, you've just uh, said. I think you've given an excellent uh, presentation, a top level view of uh, what, it, what role IT governance uh, plays or must play in the healthcare uh, ecosystem. I also think that there is the need for the regulators to also enforce uh, their compliance and monitoring uh, activities uh, because if each and every one of the regulators uh, decide to implement its, its rules and guidelines and, and processes. I'm not sure uh, any healthcare or most healthcare institutions would have uh, any uh, challenges. And I say this because uh, when you look at the Electronic Transaction Act and also the Cyber Security Act, as well as the Data Protection Act, there is there's some information as to what you should do, um, how you should manage your organizational resources the moment you decide to leverage uh, technology in whatever product or service uh, that is being uh, delivered. Okay. And in addition to that, there is also adequate information on what standards or, or, or steps you must you must adapt uh, when you embrace uh, the use of of of, of tech technology. Um, I I think because the awareness and uh, creation uh, have not been pervasive, people are kind of oblivious of the existing. Um, requirements that they are uh, that they are supposed to adhere to and it's created the opportunity for the uh, proliferation of IT charlatans which I believe see the chaos as uh, additional source of income or financially rewarding because if you are if you're an IT professional and you know the contents of the Data Protection Act and you know Cyber Security Act, as well as the Electronic Transaction Act, you would be afraid 
to do certain things. And uh, I think maybe if the regulators will step up their uh, awareness uh, creation activities, as well as their compliance and monitoring activities, it will, it will send uh, some cold shiver down the spine of uh, people and they will not trespass or stray into areas where they don't have the uh, requisite technical and business acumen to uh, operate in. Once that is not done, yeah, we can talk about IT governance, but they will say, listen, we can get away with it by introducing uh, chaos. Uh, within the ten context of IT project management, we know that there is no way an organization can uh, at the click of a button or strike of their pen buy 5,000 uh, computing devices. There are a lot of things that you must think about before you, you undertake such an activity. But then in the system that some of us operate in, it's very easy to carry out uh, such an undertaking and then there's a possibility that nobody will ask you any question until some IT auditor comes to perform uh, an IT audit and, and tries uh, to ask questions on IT value delivery, then it will be conspicuous or it become conspicuous that um, institutions have not uh, embraced best practices. So um, that is my uh, contribution. I don't know if Mr. Musa is still on uh, from NITA. Uh, you could share with us what the plans of NITA uh, is in terms of enforcing compliance and monitoring. Hello everyone, uh, please, if you have any other questions, please make them available at the moment. I think we don't have Mr. Musa available now. He had to attend to something very important. So any other questions are welcomed and we have made a link to the presentation available in the comment section. So if you're interested in acquiring the PowerPoint, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, you can have it in the chat section. There's a link there that will take you straight to the drive where you can download it from. Any other questions, please? Okay, I want to believe that every, everyone is satisfied with the presentation and we can move to the next step.
which is the closure of the webinar. So I would like to thank everyone, all participants for taking their time out to be part of this webinar. I think uh, the presenters to the two presenters. First one goes to Mr. Sam Kwashi and also Mr. CK Bruce for the insightful presentations. We would make everyone aware of the next webinar we'll be having. So we'll try to keep in touch. We hope most of you registered for the webinar. So we have your details. We will communicate as much as we can. So you will stay connected with us. Thank you once again for taking time out. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Bye bye, same.